uh, breakout session. I am Kate Garman. I'm a Smart Cities Policy Advisor in Seattle here with Dave Doyle, our Open Data Champion and Program Manager. And um, we thought it would be a great conversation to talk about um, some of the Smart City concepts as it relates to what we're all doing with data. Um, and I want to back up for a second. So I've been working in the Smart City space for three years now. I was with the city of Kansas City, Missouri before the city of Seattle. How many people associate smart cities with sensors? You could raise your hand. Wow, that's super low, that's shocking. That's great, I'm done, I'm gonna walk off the stage. Um, but I think there's been this conversation that smart city is putting sensors everywhere, which um, I think as years have gone by and lessons have been learned, is not that successful when you're trying to address human problems. So what we're talking about today is data, which we all know, um, but looking at it from a really strategic point of view, and that may or may not come from a sensor. And so data has been actually a very familiar thing with cities for a long time, um, and I want to introduce the more important John Snow, who is actually on your right. Um, John Snow is a doctor out of the UK in the 19th century. And he is the one that figured out how cholera was spreading at the time. And he went around and interviewed people in person and figured out that the systemic nature of the spreading of the virus was from water and not from air. In fact, he developed this now famous dot map, which is historically the first time a, lo a local government used data to solve a problem. And this was in 1854. So the idea of using data to solve problems has been around for a long time. Um, yet more than ever, here we are talking about it as a concept and we're honing in on it and innovating it, which is really great and exciting. But we don't need the flashy sensors that some of the smart city marketers will tell you. Um, so in Seattle, we're looking at a smart city from a very holistic sense, using data and people-centered design to further inclusion good government and innovation. Inclusion in that it has to be for everyone. Seattle, along with Austin, is one of the fastest growing cities in the country, and we need to make sure that we are growing in an equitable manner and for everyone. Um, I'll also do a tip of the hat to our PMW friend of the city of Portland, who is doing their smart city from an equity lens as well. Um, and in good government, of course, performing our basic services. We still need to pick up trash and um, pave our roads and as well as innovate and become a laboratory for innovative ideas, which Seattle is certainly well known for. Um, you see the benefits there, which of course are, are good reasons why, but the what is mostly with data networks and technology. So we need to think carefully about our telecom code, um, how we are going to value our polls, which in my opinion, I think polls are going to be equal, if not more valuable than roads. Um, and we also need to think about how we're uh, providing the internet in an equitable way. I know highways divided a lot of communities decades ago, and um, if we don't purposely talk about how we structure our internet, uh, we can see the same thing there. Um, and then, of course, through projects, policies, and partnerships. So this is the holistic approach. Um, one successful story, um, I don't want to completely take out uh, sensors and technology of the equation, but this is a good example because it goes into place for a specific use case. This is a real uh, screen of what this looks like on a project called Scoot, which is a puck that we put in the ground. It can pick up Bluetooth and Wi-Fi from people's cell phones, which gives us the data to count cars in real time on a corridor known as the Mercer Mess. It is around where Amazon is being built. It's right next to I-5, which is a corridor we don't control locally. It's a state-owned uh, network. And this project has reduced the waiting time from 34 minutes to 17, which is a really nice use case of a sensor-specific um, problem that it is solving. But when we look at sensors, we need to make sure that we have a complete story. Um, a lot of marketing and vendors are coming to cities saying that we need to put ca count cars, we need to count pedestrians. I have yet to see our use case that says because we knew in real time how many pedestrians were on this block, we were able to solve this problem. There's a lot of discussion that 
real-time pedestrian counts can help you know which streets are vibrant in your economic growth. That's not something really cities aren't aware. We know what blocks are successful and what blocks aren't. But something that we could use probably better is a real-time pedestrian count so we can give multimodal uh, intersections a real shot so that a streetlight can count people just like it can count cars. So if there's 20 people but just two cars, we can hold the green light for the pedestrians and not just for the cars. So how do we, how do we think more in the smart city space for real city needs, not just we're counting for the sake of counting? but we're counting because we want to make a difference and touch a constituent's lives. Um, and this is the slide that I want to focus on most, and it's a challenge to this data community, it's a challenge to the smart city community. I don't have the answers to these, but I think it's really important that we start posing these questions. And the first one is about internal capacity. Um, I was just talking to Kevin about how right now a whole bunch of cities just saw a wave of CTOs exit um, their role. And so we have had the word chief as a concentration of innovation, chief innovation officer, chief technology officer. How do we actually change these optics so that mid-level managers can own innovation just like a chief innovation officer can? Um, how do we inspire others whose role might not necessarily be to focus only on innovation but their job is to focus on an infrastructure project, know that there's a data set out there that we need to give to open data and to work on it, to provide metrics for maybe what were basic government projects. Um, is the staff ready and willing to use new data? Um, and this includes things like, how are we working on our language? Um, I talk to Dave all the time about how the word data set is a challenging word to me. It's uh, a little intimidating, if not borderline cold. And I'm a, I'm a lawyer, so when I hear data set, I'm like, that's something I can't manipulate or deal with or be informed on how to actually work to change and solve a problem that I have. Um, if I'm a neighbor in a neighborhood, I'm not thinking the answer to my problem of where this big belly trash can should go lies in a data set. Um, so I think we need to ask ourselves in the city community and local government, how do we make sure that staff is ready and how do we make it more approachable? in addition to things like the Socrata Academy. Um, we also need to think about where are our data gaps. Again, the concept of laying a sensor that can just see and count and have a barometer on it is not really specific to a data gap. I don't think that cities are operating and saying, if you know, we could solve all of our city problems if only I had the sensor here. Um, I think it's a combination of looking at the data that we already have and identifying what data we need. And that, I think, is how, I think hackathons would be a good way here. I think working across departments is really challenging. Um, there's even data gap in terms of, if you look at how um, crime data is used, for example, a lot of police departments have statisticians and data scientists. But they are looking at their data from the concept of how are we performing as a police department, not necessarily we see that there's a spike in crime when it gets really hot outside, we should put a community pool there. Right? Your community pool is a department of neighborhoods discussion. And oftentimes it's hard to connect those two. Same with lighting and crime. Uh, there's a, you can decrease uh, violent crime by 10% if you have better lighting in your neighborhood. And our utility is tasked with reducing the cost of providing lights and ensuring that you know, it's, it's a safe right of way. It's not necessarily thinking of the connection between crime and providing light as a utility. So there's, when I say gap, it's not just what data is missing generally, but what data can be more useful to someone who doesn't know it's there. Um, the second last question is what about other technology? I, hope that we as an innovative culture in local government can get outside of this sensor conversation because there's so much other technology there that's really important to look at like AI and machine learning um, that you know local government capacity is is tough to deal with we're all really busy in our jobs and so I think when we're purposeful and talking about technology um, sensors are just one of many solutions and then finally, um, 
we need to talk more about privacy policies and data monetization. Uh, I was at a conference in San Diego which had 27 cities and there was a legitimate argument on the position of we're collecting all this data through open data, can we monetize it, should we monetize it? There's a lot of legal liability questions of making it proprietary. There's a lot of ethical questions as is it double taxation? Has a city paid for it once and thereby the taxpayers pay for it and you're selling it a second time? You're paying for it all over again. Um, and I just, I, I think that we need to be more diligent in our conversation as the ethics on that, as well as the privacy policy. Seattle has had a robust privacy principle policy since 2014, yeah. 2014. Um, and we also put in place a surveillance ordinance last year that we're still working on and modifying. Uh, Oakland also put a surveillance ordinance in place that looks at AI use uh, from public safety. The concept of socially um, just and ethical algorithms is another area that is being discussed. New York City looked at it last year. It's a really hairy policy piece and they put a task force together to look at it further in the future, and Seattle really wants to look at this and see how we can be equitable on that technology side as well. So again, I'm sorry, I don't have um, a lot of answers, but being in this space for three years now, I think that a lot of times I hear the same conversations going on. And we really need to think about, in terms of data and smart cities especially, is that next conversation and really push ourselves a little bit more into how we're using open data. You know, what does transparency really mean? Is putting up a black set of data that no one can understand being really actually transparent? Um, and what does citizen engagement actually look like? So Dave Doyle's gonna answer all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> and Dave will have you come up. Okay, so Dave Doyle. I'm the Open Data Manager at the city, Seattle. This is a, my second year in that job, and so what I wanted to share today was just some examples of how I think about um, using data in smarter ways, the data we already have, to help us as an open data program do more, but also help the city scale in some ways, and also help our community. So uh, I'm gonna talk about three things, just using data to empower you know, the organization internally, talk about supply and demand and sort of how we're trying to bridge those two things a little more. And then, you know, what can we do differently? Um, some of these were touched on, some of the, one of the ideas I'm going to share was touched on in the keynote this morning by, by Tricia, so it's a really interesting talk. So, um, so in terms of um, empowering others, I just want to share some examples of what we've been doing. So this is a, a heat map of um, all of our data sets. This is a few weeks old now, but uh, basically, what I've been trying to do is, uh, I'm reliant on all of the departments within the city to update their data sets, to keep them up to date, to you know, update metadata, things like that. Um, we've been publishing open data since 2010. I came along in 2016, late 2016, and I realized we had a lot of sort of technical debt. We had a lot of things to clean up. And so this is a way to, to quickly identify um, if, if, if your department is listed here and you've got a metadata category here, that means you've got seven or three or four data sets that need attention, right? And it's just like a really quick, simple visual way to get a sense of like, where's all the work? It's also a way to sort of help nudge people along internally, create some friendly competition. If you don't show up on the, map, on the, on the heat map here, it means you've done, done your work. And so what it means, so you just hit one of those tiles, like you're in the department, you're in the mayor's office, so Kate, you've got some work to do. Uh, and what we do is we just populate a table that says, here are the data sets that need attention. You just open the data set, you fix what needs to be fixed, close it, and then in the next one, we refresh the data, it's, it's updated. And so it's just one way um, that we're thinking about how do I help the staff? You know, I'm a people manager uh, as well. I've been managing people for over 15 years. And so I think about management as how do I create the conditions for people to do their best work? And so this is one way, you know, we've, we've an unfunded mandate. These are staff that are already doing full-time jobs. You're doing this as extra. And so how do we make it as easy as possible for people to make sure that the data that we are providing to the public is as good a quality as possible? So this is, we're still sort of um, getting the staff to sort of help us with this work, kind of training them to, to keep going back to these data sets, to keep looking at, at these uh, reports. 
we have a sort of a, a nag mail that goes out every week or every two weeks just to say, hey, you know, here's, here's the latest data. So, so, so that's one way we, we're thinking about the data that we already have uh, and using that to help us do, do better work. So then we get into the area of like, well, what are people actually looking for in terms of information, not just open data, but in terms of like, what are people actually asking the city for? Uh, what do they want to know and how are they going about asking for that? And so this is actually a, uh, a word cloud of every single public records request we've gotten since mid-2015, I believe. So it's about 25,000 records or so that we boil down into this, this uh, word cloud. So this is uh, something we're experimenting with. We're just trying to think of different ways that we can visualize the information uh, and present it to the public disclosure officers, the people who are actually like processing all of these and saying, hey, if we use some you know, natural language processing, we extract the data out of the backend system and we start doing some more complex analysis, like what will that tell us? And so there are different ways that you can look at the data. This is just one thing we're, we're experimenting with. And so just seeing what's popping out, and so we're still working on this refining and getting rid of some of the more noise words, but uh, one thing we're going to do in the next few weeks is actually get our public disclosure officers and our open data champions, our open data stewards together, and say, uh, you, can, you can look at this, this is all over the city, this is for a particular department, this is the fire department, and you can say, so like, is there anything that's popping out of this that's sort of telling you something, uh, just saying like, this is really obviously something that we need to sort of think about. But when you couple that with other in, um, inputs like search data, like what are people searching for on Seattle.gov, uh, and looking and creating other views of the data, and just we're going to get them together and say, here's the open data we're providing you today, as we're providing to the public today. Here's actually what people are looking for, and so how do those two things align? And are there ways for us to think about using data like these to help us think about data sets that might be uh, useful for the public? In the and actually, the fire department, if you can, I'm not going to be surprised, but underground storage tanks is actually their number one uh, public, public records request. And they have actually published an open data set that's uh, updated every day. So now they just point people to that data set. And uh, over, over time, about less than 12 months, they've seen over 50% decrease in the number of requests coming in to, to, for that uh, particular um, record. And so, we're trying to think like how we go beyond that, you know, bring, bring data even closer to the people uh, through apps. They're already using things like that, um, and the fire department are already thinking about, you know, how can they you know, go beyond just that one data set into other data sets and help reduce the burden. Um, like I said, there's a lot of we get a lot of public records requests in the city. So, um, and then you know, I mentioned earlier some of the search data. This is just some, uh, something I pulled last week, but. Uh, it's essentially just what are the top buckets of, of queries people are making. And this is Google Analytics sort of grouping everything together. So I actually would love to go in and, and sort of unpack that and see what else is going on. But again, you can align these requests with what you're seeing through public records and saying like, how, how are people asking for things? Do they know the right language to use? Can we make better use of IntelliSense? Point people to existing data sets in, through the interfaces that they're using to request information from the city. How do we enable people to self-serve more easily? Uh, so, so we're trying to just align these various sources of data that we have already got. Again, so we, you know, the city of Seattle uses GovQA, so for public records, and so using their APIs that they've exposed, we basically pulled all the data out and allows us to do various things that we can't do within the existing reports in the GovQA system. So uh, this is just a very, very simple um, example of uh, the city categorizes who's requesting information when you submit a records request. And so this is basically that. And so it helps, this is all up for the city, but we could slice it by year or by department. And so it tells you like, who are the cohorts of the population that are most requesting information from you? And what are they looking for? And so it just helps drive a conversation uh, with the public disclosure officers. And I was surprised by one or two of the cohorts. Actually, there were groups of people I never would have thought about. Um, and then here's another example of something you can do with the data once you've extracted it out from, from your backend system. One of the uh, engineers in my team said, hey, what if we just grouped all of the email addresses by domain and just see what it tells us? So what I've highlighted it in red uh, is King County. Seattle is based in King County, and yet King County is the number two requester by email type, email domain uh, of public records. And so I went to the public disclosure officer and said, why is that? Because physically, they're literally across the street. Their building is right across the street from ours. And so 
sort of unpacking, like why are they putting in over 800 public records requests, which are very expensive for everybody. You know, people entering them, they're complex, and also people fulfilling them. And it's just, I don't know, it's just the data person in me thinks that there's, there's more to this, uh, that we can do better. And so it just really helps drive those conversations about, you know, like why are these behaviors occurring? And can people just get together and figure this out? And so, uh, Uh, 20, 2015. Okay. So part of like the last, second half of 2015 through through today. So okay. about two and a half years of data, roughly. So. I've also noticed that Paul from King County is not in here. Yeah. He's here at the conference. He's not in here. Yeah, he's hiding <laughs> from me right now. <laughs> um, so just conscious of time, I want to um, uh, just make sure we leave some time for questions. So the final thing I wanted to talk about, and this was touched upon in the keynote this morning, but you know, getting people out of your buildings and into the community and thinking about data a little differently. So this is not something, this is something I'm just pointing to, it's datawalking.org. Uh, I highly encourage you to take a look at that site. It's got some really great resources on how to do these kinds of activities. But essentially, data walking is just getting, getting a group of people together, about seven or eight people. It's one person takes notes, one person takes photographs, one person sort of acts as an interviewer. Other people are just observing, so you can stop and talk to people. You pick a neighborhood, you walk through that neighborhood, you map it out, and you take photographs along the way. Um, and then you come, you, you sort of, uh, I'll give you an example. So I went on, on one of these walks. We did this event a few months ago. Um, and um, this is not the walk I went on, it was another group, just to give you an example. So that's our building up on top, and we went around the neighborhood. Um, and so, if, you, if I was to scale this out, you'd see there's all the photographs, our tag, geotags, so you see exactly where we took them. But what was really interesting was we were going into buildings and we were looking at like what literature was being provided by the city and community centers, like who was there at particular points of the day, just talking to people about you know, what they were doing, um, just observing. Uh, and it was, there were four separate groups that, on that particular day that we did this. And I, you know, I, I initially opened this up as something for the open data people to, to join. But um, afterwards, I realized that like urban planners showed up and other people from across the city showed up. People that I had never, I don't know them, I, I'd never met them before, but it was great, word got out. And it was a very quick and fun way, it was like one or two hours just going out <coughs> and exploring a neighborhood, looking at it through a different lens. Um, and you know, not just the photographs, but taking physical um, data points back. So it could be leaflets, it could be posters you see on the street, things like that. Um, and then we came back, all four groups came back into a conference room like this. We did a debrief and just shared what did we learn from that. And then the individual groups have sort of taken that and, and they're continuing to work on what they saw and what they learned. So it's just another way to get uh, an input from the community about what are their needs, what's going on. So what we have big data, but this sort of helps provide a lot of the small data that sort of gives you the context on what you're seeing in the, in the larger uh, data sets. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, it's cheap. You just have to go out and walk a couple, one or two hours. And uh, it's a really, really great way, it's a really great framework to use just to get out to the community and explore a neighborhood, especially if you're like working a project related there. So I just wanted to share that, because we have, we've done it, and I think we're gonna write a blog post on it in the near future, just about our experiences, so. So there were just so many examples that, uh, that I wanted to share about just how we're trying to do things a little differently, either with the data that we already have, or how do we go about uh, getting extra data from, from the communities that we are serving. Um, for instance, you know, all of the neighborhoods that we visited on that data walk um, have sensors to greater or lesser degree already in them, but as I was saying to Kate earlier, a sensor, you can't have a conversation with a resident, you know, but we can when we go out there, so it just helps give us more context. Do you want to speak to the first two? We're just, we're just wrapping up, so summary, so um, that's it. So we've about five minutes, we can take some questions. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I'm Fausto from the New York City Tax and Limousine Commission. And uh, I, I love the contrast between sort of the legal perspective and the, the data perspective. I'm, I'm the, the data side, so I'm with you. Uh, but I also understand how important it is to make sure that we don't collect too much information, especially when it sort of breaches people's trust and their privacy. Are there policies in place for Seattle? I think you mentioned something like this. 
And if there are, do you believe there should be policies in place that require the government, local and federal, or whatever level, to really work very hard to justify why it needs certain data, whether that be from private entities or from the public? Because at some level, those things do permit, uh, sort of invade people's privacy, right? Right, no, great question. So we actually have a chief privacy officer and a team of four people, and they do privacy impact assessments on most, on all technologies that we acquire. IT just did a huge consolidation two and a half years ago. So if any department acquires technology, it goes through the IT department. That allows us to do a few things, um, including the privacy assessment and making sure that technologies aren't redundant over the uh, network of the city. So they are the ones that literally require each department to put in what is happening with the data, what's being collected, and how is it being used. It goes through a general assessment. If there needs to be more questions, it gets a more thorough assessment. Our surveillance technology, um, or, or surveillance ordinance rather, is specific to technologies that can surveil. There's a very specific definition with just a few exceptions, um, including monitoring, uh, infrastructure like dams and body-worn police cameras are an exception as well. So I would actually go so far as to say that I think Seattle has the most progressive privacy and surveillance laws in the country. And I think that um, other cities, I actually just read yesterday that there's a conversation on the federal level, thanks to Facebook and some other considerations, for a federal privacy law. But I think cities should really make it their own and make it more based on constituents. I would just add one thing, um, also on the open data side specifically, in January we published the final report on a privacy risk assessment of our open data program. That was the first of its kind in the US, and so that was sort of an extension of the privacy policies and so on. Um, and it's part of our annual risk assessment work that we do on the open data program. So it was looking at open data program holistically, but also uh, if we were linking data from other sources, state, county, you know, national, uh, what are the risks there? So, so that's public. and. I would, I encourage you to check it out, it's, it's pretty exciting. SPF. SPF.org uh, did the work, uh, Future Privacy Forum in DC. Any questions? No hard thing questions? I was going to get them all today. So I'm from Ramsey County, Minnesota, and um, we have very, we call them restrictive privacy laws. Where a lot of our departments can't share data together. And so when you say progressive surveillance and uh, data laws, do you mean the user's protected or the government has more ability to share? The user is protected. Okay. I like how you put that though. Because uh, I think that too about like the public uh, disclosure law that Dave's talked talk to. The state of Washington, in my opinion, and in several others, is one of the most, I don't know if you want to call it strict or liberal, public disclosure laws in the country, we can't, we have zero exceptions to hold on to data. And that is in direct conflict with our privacy, uh, our privacy priority. So if, when we want to protect pri uh, personally identifiable information, we can't collect data at all. It is the privacy poli policy of Seattle to not collect, if not collect and then filter. So um, because of that, and we have 12,000 requests a year at the city of Seattle, and we don't get compensated for very, very limited compensation opportunities. So in terms of both privacy and the ROI that open data has given our public disclosure laws, um, it's a real value contribution. Yeah, the data, last data I saw on that was about 2% return on the cost, just if you look at just pure cost. Uh, so yeah, it's a big, it's a big, uh, yeah. big issue for us. Yeah. And we, and it's all online too, our privacy policy is on Seattle.gov. Thank you guys.